Okay, you guys ready? No, I'm still trying to get this tripod out. We'll put your tripod down. <laughs> we're just gonna wait. wait let's, let's, yeah, we're not gonna start. Yeah. We're gonna. Wait, 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 <laughs> All right, I suppose. Okay, so for the people paying attention and watching this live, thank you so much for joining in tonight's digital dark room hangout. We're gonna go over some tips and tricks in Lightroom and Photoshop and. I'm going to guess that Brian's probably going to share some on-one software tips as well. Maybe. Surely not. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe not. So uh, <laughs> let's go ahead and just do a quick introduction. We'll start with Brian. Oh, thank you, Nicole. Oh, you're welcome. Um, well, my name is uh, Brian Matias. I am the education manager at on-one software. Um, I try to make your on-one lives easier. Um, but no, I'm, a, I'm a photographer. Uh, I was a commercial photographer before I was at Omlon, and I specialized in uh, uh, like real estate and hotels and restaurants and stuff like that. And uh, uh, HDR is a uh, one of those things that was, was, has been very important to me. So uh, I'm actually going to share an HDR tip today from start to finish. Um, and you can find me pretty easily. Uh, I give full credit to uh, my little cohort there, Dave Veffer. Uh, you can find me by going to plusbrian.com. Dave's great idea, so uh, <laughs> makes it pretty easy. Right Dave, on. you're up. So Please. my name is Dave Veffer. I am the uh, I'm an IT guy at a commercial photography studio. I'm also an amateur photographer, and you can find me at plusdave.com. That brings you to my Google Plus profile. Nice. Well, I am I next? Yes, you're next. It looks like it. Okay. I'm James Brandon. Uh, I'm a photographer in Fort Worth, Texas, and I've uh, been doing it for about three years now. I'm a, uh, I do portraits and commercial work, uh, travel, weddings, whatever. And um, today I'll be sharing some tips in Photoshop with uh, a technique called luminosity masking, which is kind of a, um, a different way to go about doing HDR inside of Photoshop. So it uh, should be interesting. All right, and I am Nicole Young. I'm a stock and food photographer. I'm an author. I'm also certified in Adobe Photoshop CS5, and I'm a help desk specialist with the National Association of Photoshop Professionals, which means I basically just answer email help desk questions uh, all relating to Photoshop and Bridge. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started here. And for anyone watching live, if you guys have any questions, on Photoshop, Lightroom, on one software, just general questions, or if you have any specific questions about what we're sharing, like the tips and everything that we're sharing, if we maybe go past a keyboard shortcut or something and you want us to maybe type it in the comments or just actually talk about it you know, what in the Hangout, uh, go ahead and post that comment to the original uh, on-air Hangout thread that's on my page, and we're going to refresh that and just watch that as it's going. We don't have a chat set up or anything. Uh, so, but if this becomes an ongoing thing, then we'll, we'll get to that point. But for now, we're just going to watch the comments. So, okay, well, I think I'm going to go ahead and, and start us off here to get the ball rolling. And let me just get set up, share my screen. Okay. Sure that we're set on me there. Okay, so this is a photograph that I took over in uh, in Vietnam in Hoi An. It's one of my favorites uh, of the entire trip, and I kind of go back and forth on this uh, line that's going across the top here because you know this is wire, and I kind of want to see what it looks like without it. And so I'm going to show you guys a really cool trick on how to get rid of any kind of power line or any really thin line uh, that's going across your image. And I'm going to do this with, uh, by using the pen tool to start off. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to duplicate this background because I'm, I, I'm, I pretty much have to work on the layer and I don't want to uh, destroy any of the pixels. So I just use the keyboard shortcut Command J to duplicate that layer. And I'm going to zoom in really close. And I could if I wanted to. I could go straight over to the spot healing brush tool. And what this does is, you know, when you just paint over it, and it just kind of removes those, those, you know, whatever you're trying to remove. It, it uses content to wear. I actually have it set up here to content to wear, and it just kind of heals that area. But 
to have to go through this entire thing and just paint, I, you know, it wouldn't be super tedious, but there's actually a much quicker way. So I'm going to go ahead and jump over to the pen tool. Now, I will say that most uh, people, if you're using the pen tool for the first time, it takes a little bit of practice. <laughs> so you might not, you might just, if you really want to get a feel for the pen tool, just take it out and then just try and trace around things and you'll, uh, you'll, you'll start getting an understanding of how it works. And I know on the screen all you can see is my cursor, but trust me, I have the pen tool activated. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, draw my line across. If you guys can see this all okay. And I'm going to use a couple points here. I'm just basically outlining this. Uh, you know what? I actually think I have to backtrack and do something in a second. Here, I'll show you. I'll show you what this does, and then I'll show you how to fix it because I made a mistake. The magic of live television, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> All right, and there. So I have it outlined. It's probably kind of hard to tell on the screen. Uh, just because it's a really, really thin line. But if I go over to the path uh, tool, you can actually see that I have that, uh, I'm sorry, the path panel. You can see that I have that line going across there. So uh, what I want to do is I want to stroke this path with the, uh, with the spot healing brush. And what I wanted to say is the thing, the reason I made a, a quote unquote mistake was I want to make sure that this, uh, you can't even see it on the thing, can you? All right, so I have my uh, spot healing brush, and the size is set fairly small. And you, you know, all you're seeing is a cursor on my screen, so I apologize. It's not really set up well for, I guess, for Photoshop. But what I want to do is uh, I want to make sure that I'm not just including this line here. There's a shadow right underneath that carries all the way along on the, the yellow wall, and I need to make sure that that also is, a, uh, is also going to be healed away and out of the image. Otherwise, it's going to look funny. I have this strange shadow going through the image without anything that's creating the shadow. So I'm actually going to increase the size of my brush. And uh, oops, let me do that. I'm actually, I use my bracket keys to uh, increase the size. And trust me, it's getting bigger. <laughs> so now I have a, a brush size that's actually big enough uh, to stroke this whole thing and not just get that little tiny uh, line there. So to actually get to the magic, I'm going to go over to my path. I'm going to right click and click Stroke Path. And I already have it selected here, obviously, because I was testing this out. But uh, you just click on that drop down and select the uh, Spot Healing Brush, because it's usually not going to be the first one activated. And then uh, click OK. You can see it's just kind of doing its magic. It's working, depending on how fast your computer is. <laughs> it might take longer. <laughs> depending how big your file is, it might take longer. And there we go. Uh, can you guys see? Yep. So yep. It, did, it did an okay job. I'm, uh, obviously, there are some, some areas here that it really kind of fudged up. And I'm actually gonna, I can actually fix those real quickly. We'll what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to, um, actually going to uh, let's see, I'll just go ahead and erase this part. I'm just erasing the layer. Because if I wanted to actually fix that again, what I'll do is I'll just use the exact same method. I'll just use a smaller stroke. You showed me this uh, the other day. I did, yeah. My images. So I'm just going to go ahead and I'll just do it on the background layer here to make it easy. Uh, go back to the pen tool. Actually, sorry, I'm going to go back to my um, spot healing brush, and I'm going to reduce the size of the brush. So it's just a really small, it, all it's going to affect is the, little, is the line that goes across here. So I brought it down to 30 pixels. And I'm going to go back to the pen tool and just draw path, stroke path, spot healing brush. And then I'll just do the same thing right over here. Oops. Get rid of that path. Hey, Nicole, when you use the yeah. path tool, are you using um, the rubber band feature? I'm not sure if I have that. I don't think so. I don't know. I, hold on a second, let me do this real quickly. Um, I don't know, I just, use the, I just use a normal pen tool. <laughs> I don't Is there a way to get a, a full, uh, the uh, YouTube link so that people can watch in full screen? Oh, yeah, Dave, do you have that? Do you know how to get that? Sure, I'll do that. Thank you. Good call. Okay, and so... you can just post it in the comments section. 
All right, so that was my, uh, there's kind of the before, and there's the after. I mean, there might be a little bit of cleanup I need to go in and do, but it did a pretty good job. So, there's my tip. Were there any questions on that that you saw? There weren't any questions on th that other than to make it, um, the, uh, you know, a full screen display. But there were other questions that, that are interesting to talk about. Um, so I don't know if you want to do that now. We'll go ahead and get to that after. I want to use, I'll do the Q&A for the end. I want to make sure everyone gets their, their tip in. Okay. So. Yeah, so like unless the question is specifically about what Nicole talked about. Yeah. Do you want to go ahead and do yours, Brian? Uh, sure, if you'd like. Go I for would. It, Brian. I'll go ahead and share my screen then. Uh, my desktop. All right, so you see my desktop here, um, and uh, I figured it's um, it'd probably just be fun to do a tone map and HDR image, um, and so I'll go ahead and first sh sh show you the uh, brackets here. Um, it's an image I posted a while back, and I've always enjoyed working on it um, because it was just a fun time overall, and it's a, it's a really good illustration of why uh, HDR is, is very valid when it's done correctly. You know, it's actually a, something that, that has its merits in photography. So I took this shot here. Um, it was an abandoned school that my buddy Steve Beal got us access to, and uh, the whole thing is, as, let me just start actually with the mid-range exposure so you can get an idea of what the scene looks like. So this was the scene um, standing in this classroom and <clears throat> this would probably be closer to what your camera would expose to because it's trying to meter for getting the most amount of exposure here and unfortunately it comes at the expense of uh, your highlights and your shadows. You see that it looks like there's like this nuclear holocaust outside but in actuality if you scroll up to the uh, fastest bracket it was a beautiful day. And so um, I use a device on my camera called a remote control um, that allows me to bracket. It allows me to exceed the Canon's uh, limited three exposure bracketing um, without touching the camera. So I have nine here, and I'll just walk you through them really quickly. This is the uh, exposure for the highlights, and then we start going through um, getting mid-tones. And then we're getting shadows. Now, uh, one of the things here that I want to talk about uh, for the photographers out there is the kind of concept of uh, composing. And I'm, I'm, you know, there are different camps here, the difference between composing and framing, and I think they're both mutually exclusive of each other. Um, and when I think of framing, I think of um, the way that you position your camera on your tripod or the way you hold it relative to the scene in front of you. Um, so framing, you know, I put the camera kind of, I perched it, behind this uh, teacher's table um, and, and, you know, tilted it so that the teacher's uh, desk was uh, intersecting the lower third uh, part of the frame. That's framing, in my opinion. Composing is more where you actually interact with the scene. And so these two pieces of paper I actually found in another classroom and I grabbed them with me. I took the chalk from the chalkboard and I uh, drew. It was really awesome that the, ta the teacher's table was actually a chalkboard. So um, I drew this kind of thing over here, and uh, <laughs> had I had more foresight, I actually should have removed this stuff, but it'll give me an opportunity to use content or fill to remove it, which is what I did in the final product. Um, so uh, that's just a quick, a quick thing on, on composing versus framing. Um, both are kind of very important. That's how I use the terms. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take these nine exposures, and I'm just going to right-click on them, uh, and send them to Photomatix, uh, which is what I use for my tone mapping. Um, so it's going to launch here, uh, wherever it is. Let me just make sure it's actually on this desktop and not on the desktop. Oh, wait, it's over here. So I need to uh, find it. I have it spread across. I have like 20 different desktops, if you can see this. Uh, here we go. Um, merge for HDR. So I'm going to actually take this window and move it to uh, desktop one. There. All right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to merge for HDR processing and I'm going to let it do its thing with the nine brackets. Now, um, if there were 
any uh, moving elements in this shot, I probably would turn on the Remove Ghosts uh, with the first radio button, which is Selective Deghosting. Nothing was moving. Uh, the images were on, the camera's on a tripod, so I don't need to align anything. Uh, I don't do noise reduction um, here in, uh, in tone mapping. I don't, do, I don't do any stylization in tone mapping. Uh, so the only thing I will do is reduce any of that chromatic aberration that might have come if there's a really high contrast from the bright to the dark. So I'm going to reprocess or pre-process that, and it's going to do its thing. Now, uh, if you're new to HDR, uh, one of the things I recommend, especially with photomatics, let me fit this to screen, um, is to reset your settings. Um, and you can do that just by hitting default. And what that does is it sets everything to these uh, factory defaults. They're kind of wonky as to what they think factory default should be, but um, it's definitely a good practice if you're learning how to tone map. Uh, so the other thing that I strongly recommend is when you're tone mapping, always have your histogram up. The histogram is really important because it tells you, it shows you your, your tone curve and uh, it tells you whether your uh, highlights are being uh, blown out or if your shadows are being clipped. And you can get that by going to view and then show the 8-bit histogram over there. Um, so you can see actually right there that uh, if you're blowing out highlights, you'll, it'll be indicated as such because uh, the, uh, the data will be bunching up on the right. And this portion here, these are your highlights, your midtones, and your shadows. So uh, let's start fixing this. I know right off the bat that we're blowing out our highlights um, because the default white point is 0.25%, way too high. So we're going to drag that back, and you can see instantly in one fell swoop it recovers our highlights. Um, for urbex scenes like this, uh, I always bring my strength up to 100%. Um, I just like the way it looks. But um, here's a key here. I think a lot of people make their mistakes uh, several ways with uh, tone mapping. And the first is, the cl this is the classic mistake, and this is essentially what gave HDR that bastardized uh, <laughs> uh, reputation, is that a lot of people were in the lighting effects, and they click on this surreal plus, which um, ultimately ruins your image. That looks great. Doesn't it? <laughs> plus I mean, one. This, this is done. exactly what it looked done. like when I was standing there, um, <laughs> and I was high on LSD. Um, <laughs> No, so you really don't want to use this. In fact, I don't really understand why this option is here. It's my own editorial comment, but um, you really should be using the lighting adjustment slider. Um, once I get the strength, uh, the next thing that I'll do is um, I'll use I'll adjust luminosity and detail con contrast. So I'll bring the luminosity up a bit, um, and I'll also bring detail contrast up. Now, I think a big uh, mistake that a lot of people make when tone mapping is they start stylizing and tone mapping. And, and in my personal opinion, tone mapping should not be used for stylization. Tone mapping should be used for restoring tone. So um, you see a lot of people bring up their luminosity up to 100% and their detail contrast up to 100%. And you can see how it's giving you a stylized look, but you're, it's at the penalty of the image. You really shouldn't be doing this. Um, there are more effective tools, like Perfect Effects by On One Software, um, <laughs> that will do a better job for you. So I'm going to bring back the luminosity and the detail contrast. Um, and then one, um, one thing I'm also going to do is uh, first extend my uh, menu bar so I can actually see the rest of my controls. Um, I'm going to bring up the gamma, which is the brightness of the image. Now, uh, with tone map images, especially with uh, these kinds of gritty uh, urbex images, I typically will start brighter than normal. Um, I'll make sure that I'm not clipping my highlights, or blowing out my highlights, rather, or clipping my shadows, but I will typically have uh, the image brighter than I uh, would if it was a single exposure. And that's because uh, stylization takes a heavy impact on the gamma of the image. It, it really darkens your image. And so... While this may look good right around here, or even a little bit darker, um, it'll get that much more darker uh, in processing. So you want to give yourself a little bit of a handicap uh, with brightness. Uh, and so here, the lighting adjustments, this, this is totally subjective. Uh, you'll never see me uh, go beyond negative two. Um, if anything, sometimes I'll go back to the plus. But here, we can kind of take our lighting adjustments. This is the smooth, the light smoothing. This is, gives you what would be called that kind of HDR look, if anything. Um, and so here, I'm just making little adjustments. These sliders are pulleys. 
they're very much a pulley system. If you increase one, you typically will decrease another one to compensate. And my goal here is to get a natural look. And you know, I think uh, you guys here would probably agree this is pretty natural. If anything, I can make it stand to make it even a bit brighter. But this doesn't scream, uh, you know, anything really special. This is what the room looked like. My eyes were able to discern the darker parts plus the brightest parts of the image without uh, any real trouble. So now that we're done, I'm going to hit process, which will give me that tone map image, and I'm going to save it out as um, might as well just save it out as a TIFF uh, to the desktop here and just call it uh, Urbex. So with the TIFF done, uh, I'm going to send it to Photoshop really quickly uh, so that we can do some fun stuff. Let me realign. I actually uh, decreased the resolution oops, of the screen so that it could be so you could see my stuff a little bit better. Um, and let me fit this to the screen. All right, so kind of a few things that I want to do. Uh, let me bring my a few panels in here so you could see. Um, I'll just keep the layers panel off. Uh, the first thing I'll try to do is um, I'll use make a, a quick and dirty selection. And uh, I'll do this really quickly just to test how good the content aware fill is. So for those of you that uh, didn't see what I did, I selected uh, the selection tool here. Um, I made a selection around this area, and then I could go to edit and then fill, and then make sure under the contents you're going to use content aware, and then hit OK. And uh, it should do a pretty good job, and uh, as expected, it did a perfect job, so I'm not going to touch it again. Um, I'll do the same thing here, get rid of that. And I'm actually hitting Shift-Delete to give me this, the, uh, this fill menu, so that's what's giving um, me that right there. Um, and there, I think, oh yeah, for this right here, I probably would take the clone stamp, um, make it a lot smaller, about the size of the actual item, and then source it from here maybe, and then try to align it so that I get it. Now, I would work on this a little bit faster. I'm not going to spend too much time on it because I don't want to eat into Dave's and Jimmy Bob's time. But um, Now, for this here, I could do one of two things. I can either just uh, take my chances and clone it, uh, just like uh, I did with the uh, that other little piece of plastic, and that's working okay. Or if I wanted to, if I was really lazy, I could have just cropped in a tiny bit. As it is, I still have to rotate. This is slightly, you can see the desk is slightly off. Um, and then let me take the uh, content aware healing brush, get rid of that. And I'm just kind of, at this point, being nitpicky. I'm just getting rid of certain little things. Uh, I want to get rid of that see how that works. That does not look good, so I will take my chance with the content aware selection again. Yeah, it seems to sample there. So I'm actually okay with that to a degree. Let's just leave it alone for now. Um, but I've gotten rid of a lot of the stuff, which is great. Um, now I'm going to actually send this uh, to Perfect Effects uh, in Photoshop. I go into File, uh, Automate, and then go into Perfect Effects. Uh, where is my part? There it is. And uh, this is going to be quick. Oh, how is it in use? I know why. It's because I have it launched over there. Oops. There, let's try this one more time. <laughs> File automate, perfect effects. I was actually looking something up. There was a question on sharpening, and I wanted to um, talk about perfect resize. So that's why I had it launched. Um, really quickly, a few things I'll do. Um, is I'll go to the movie looks category and I'm going to go to the urban sickness um, effect, which is what if you in the on my uh, original shot that I posted, this is the effect that kind of gave it the, the look that I was going for, that kind of post-apocalyptic look. Um, and the key here is not just taking a 100% strength, uh, all the effects that you want to apply, you typically bring it to zero and then bring it up gradually. Uh, I'll hit add and then I might you know, the custom tonal contrast effect. Um, tonal contrast will give detail. So you can see here under the local contrast ladder, as I jack it up, um, it adds a lot of detail. This is another uh, pitfall that a lot of photographers fall into is that they'll apply it and they'll think that this is actually good. And it's not. It's actually really bad. What you want to do is get it to a point here and then drop the strength down. Um, texture is something that uh, is, is really nice in small doses. You don't need to, to overpower the image with texture. Um, the last thing I'll do here in perfect effects is I'm going to go to the color and tone, then go to lighter, and then with the curve, or rather with the slider up here, I'm going to bring the brightness up. 
Now, my goal here is just to keep the uh, lower portion, the desk, brighter than the background. And so in one fell swoop with the masking bug that I selected, I click in the image, I orient the image, I put the bug over the desk, um, and then I'll bring the inspector up. And what I'm doing with the inspector is I'm going to invert the mask. So it essentially flips the, um, the mask around. Uh, and so you can see the before and the after if I hide the effects bar here. Here's the original image. And then that's what we were able to do um, with effects. I'll hit apply. And then there's one last thing that I want to do. Um, now, I've, I do recommend that as you start working in all these layers, that you routinely um, save your images. So I just want to see where my image went. <laughs> there it is. Um, save. And then one last thing I'm going to do is go to focal point. Uh, because what I, what I, I really want to emulate is a shallow depth of field. So by sending it to focal point, let me just bring this here and reset our settings. Um, I'm able to use a focus bug, which uh, will allow me to select what area of the image is in focus. So by default, I'm going to change my focus bug from round to planar, which gave me uh, now a planar bug. Kind of like the masking bug before, I'm going to kind of make this uh, more horizontal. Put it on the uh, foreground, which is the plane of focus that I want to have. And now here's the key thing here. Um, You don't really need this much blur. This is pretty awful. Um, focal point is best used in very, very small doses. Something like, you see how the amount here? I'm only going to go to about maybe 4% blur. It's just enough to kind of give it credibility that this was a shallow depth of field. Um, I can also further bring focus down here by dropping the brightness of that background and boosting the contrast. Um, and then we're going to hit uh, apply. And um, there we go. So if we just take a quick walkthrough. This was our tone mapped image. Um, this was our image that we stylized with the perfect effects. And then this was the uh, image that we rendered into a shallow plane of focus with, um, with focal point. So that is uh, my little tip. I have a question for you, Brian. Was that your wonderful handwriting? That was my handwriting. <laughs> You spelled session wrong. Yeah, I was going to I know, I know. I, I want to go, well, you see, I, I went with the whole zero instead of the O. We call that... Um, You're a hacker. Yeah. We were hashing, um, and I wanted to go all, you know, cool with the backwards E. Um, I should have made the S's fives or something, or, or backwards S's, but, um, you know, that's for another time. Awesome. All Thanks, right. Brian. You're welcome. All right, I guess uh, I'll go next. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. I have a very, very quick tip about the new uh, adjustment brush features in Lightroom 4 beta. Um, I just have an example here of a, a shot I tone mapped in Photomatics, and when I brought it back in to Lightroom, I'm not sure how well this translates on the Hangout, but it's like super, super noisy in the sky. Yeah, we can see it. OK, so all I'm going to do is use the adjustment brush here. Oh, and I so love your uh, identity. Four, right? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah, this is Lightroom 4 beta. All right, so a beta. So this is a new feature. Yeah, it's not out yet, but you can download the beta over at the Adobe website if you guys want to try these out. Yeah, for try free? it out for, for sure, for free. It's <laughs> awesome. So I'm just going to, for the purpose of this uh, demo, um, I can turn on auto mask here and and get like a mask area and not pick up the building, which I'll do. So I'm gonna just for the sake of the demo here, I'm gonna enable show selected mask overlay so you guys can see what I'm masking. But I'm not gonna select everything, but I'm just gonna kind of bump it into here a little bit because I want to remove some of this noise, but I don't want to remove it out of the building itself because the detail would start suffering. Um, Normally, I would reduce the overall noise of the whole image first, um, but I just want to show you guys real quick how I can just affect the sky with this mask I made. Um, so the new feature is this noise slider. Um, 
There's also a moiré slider, which I'm not going to use right now. <laughs> Maybe I will. But uh, the noise slider, it's counterintuitive because the other noise slider you drag to the left to make it reduce noise, but this one you got to drag to the right. So you can already see it taking all that noise out where I had it masked, but not affecting the building. Cool. So that there is my handy dandy little uh, Lightroom 4 beta tip. Awesome. Thank so you. are you using Lightroom 4, Dave, for pretty much all your work now, or just when you want to mess around with it and see what's um, new? Pretty much any image I've been working on, I'll, 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 fi I'll find it in Lightroom 3, and then mm -hmm. once I've um, decided on image, I'll, I'll pull up the file and then import it into Lightroom 4 and just work on that one image in 4. Yeah, because yeah, I, I also read that you're not supposed to edit an image in Lightroom 4 that you've already edited in 3. Um, well, you can. Um, you just have to con you could have That's to convert it. Adobe side. Yeah, like if, if it has different settings on it. Yeah, you'll have to update the processing on it to the mm. newest version so it'll change it. So if you've already edited photos in Lightroom, uh, you know, Lightroom 3, once you bring right. them into uh, the raw files into Lightroom 4, you're going to have to click that button saying yes, you want to convert them over, and then they're just going to look different. So you want to start with yeah, so Lightroom 3. So right here, uh, you can see that, like, I have the virtual copy that I made. So from the original, mm -hmm. it has, because I did work on this in Lightroom 3, it has this little exclamation mark when you're in the develop mode. And it's yeah. warning me that I'm not in the 2012 process mode. So I can either just click that and update it or scroll all the way down and choose 2012 process mode, and that'll convert it. And it, it tries to do the best job it can with converting your previous effects because the sliders mm -hmm. all have different kind of values nowadays in the new version. Um, sometimes it's a big change. Sometimes you don't really notice it, but yeah. you can go ahead and update that. But that does update it for both, and then you won't be able to modify it basically in Lightroom 3 anymore, unless you just, unless you bring it back down to the Lightroom 3 process mode. Cool. Now, there's a there's a question actually in the um, in the comments, and uh, Brennan Gallagher was asking about if we have a preferred program to use for noise removal, like Noise Ninja, Photoshop, Lightroom, et cetera, and it kind of goes along with your tips, so I thought we could just kind of jump in and talk about that real quickly if you guys yeah. have any comments. Yeah, yeah. I choose, um, me, I just use Lightroom now. I think the noise reduction is really good in Lightroom. Yeah, I think they really um, took a, a with, I never really used it um, until Lightroom 4 beta because um, I'm with Dave, I, I, I refuse to let noise reduction be global to my image. Mm -hmm. um, and so the brush itself is fantastic um, for those people that don't have Lightroom at all or, or they don't have Lightroom 4 yet. Um, one of the cool things that you could do is um, just do a virtual copy, um, then do the, your full noise reduction uh, on that image and then either send it to, to Photoshop or to Perfect Layers, whichever your layer workflow solution is, and just mask them together. Um, that's already using uh, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> His shirt disappeared. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> so trying my, I'm trying to fix the, my webcam, so I switched to another one. But yeah, Dave's having webcam issues, so it, all, all of a sudden his um, red there shirt disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> so we he's going on down. I'm back. It worked. It worked. <laughs> so now I'm going to take off my shirt. Nice. <laughs> slowly. Do really slowly. Don't really <laughs> confused. <laughs> So um, now just real quickly, uh, Mark Rainier asked uh, if you can use noise reduction selectively in Lightroom, and we actually, uh, Dave's tip just went over that with the adjustment brush. So Lightroom 3, you cannot. Lightroom 4, you have the noise removal where you can do that selectively. Yeah. Right. So. And it's awesome. Now I, I love uh, Topaz Denoise. Don't you use Noise Ninja? I, I don't actually anymore. I used to have it. I think that when I up updated my software on my computer. I think I lost the, the version I had. It didn't work any longer. Yeah, That pirated um, serial number. No. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I had it for a while and it did. It worked really, really well. Um, but honestly, I don't do very much noise reduction in my images because when I shoot for stock, most of the stuff I'm shooting is going to be at a very low ISO. Mm -hmm. uh, when I'm doing landscape, it's already at a very low ISO because I'm on a tripod, so I don't need to, and I'm usually wanting a long exposure, so I don't need to worry about a really fast, you know, shutter speed with a really sensitive uh, ISO speed. So, and the cameras these days are so good that uh, anytime I do get grain or noise in my images, I'm usually okay with it. You know, of course, if you're going to push up to like 3200 ISO, then you're going to start seeing noise. 
but yeah. I don't really use much noise reduction in my images. The one that I used to use, and I brought this up on the, the other, I can't remember where I brought it up, but like really quickly was... Noiseware? <laughs> no, yeah, Noiseware Pro, Imagenomic. Um, I think it's Imagenomics. No, it's Imagenomics. And they still haven't fixed it, have they? It's, it's, it's so obnoxious. I don't know where these guys get off. Um, they had this amazing product um, called Noiseware Pro that... Uh, they never updated to 64-bit on the Mac. They went for the PC and, and did it, but not for the Mac, which, you know, as a, as a vendor myself, or working for a software company, it's like, if we were to release um, our Mac update before our PC or vice versa, there would be, you know, hell to pay. Hell. <laughs> and so here it's like, you know, if you go to the noise where they actually have it in their forums, and it's really obnoxious, where if you go here and uh, they have their whole CS you know, 64-bit Noiseware Pro release. Last post was on the 25th. Um, just there's nothing here. Um, uh-huh. it was, it, they say it's been in beta forever, but um, who knows? Anyway, so that was uh, that's what I used to use, but now with Lightroom 4, I can't see myself using anything else. But also to Nicole's point, um, I rarely um, find myself with noise issues. Yeah. Yeah, HDR is usually the main culprit of bringing in noise unless you just shoot at something incredibly high on your eyes, so these days. But uh, James, noise... Uh, you, oh, yeah, interrupting well, yeah, you. I was just going to say noise, <laughs> is a, to <laughs> noise is a good segue into kind of what I was going to show, so awesome. let me bring up my, my screen here. All right, can you guys see it? Indeed. All right. Um, so what I was going to go you, over. Not to do, are you focusing on James's screen so that the? Yeah. All right. Good. Okay. Um, I thought I'd go over a, a new technique that I've been messing around with for the last few months in Photoshop, uh, called luminosity masking, and it was a fairly new term to me. I had heard it a few times before, but never really investigated it or tried to figure out what it was. When I did, it kind of just opened up a whole new window into what I could do in Photoshop. So it's really cool. And I really haven't been using um, Photomatics as much since then for any type of HDR work or exposure blending that I've been doing. I still use it from time to time if I really need like seven or nine exposures for a shot. Then it's easier just to throw it into Photomatics. But for this one, it's just two exposures that I needed. And I've already stylized these a little bit in Lightroom and then pulled them over as layers into uh, Photoshop. So I only have two. So I have you know this darker exposure here that has the foreground properly lit. You can see the light and the little flowers here. And then this darker one for the background. So for the longest time for me, and I'm sure this is true with other people too, um, when you open up Photoshop for the first time, you have your layers and then your channels right down here on the right and your paths all on one level. And most people don't really spend much time checking out channels or paths. But your channels are basically just the um, colors that make up your image. So you have your RGB channel, which is all three of them. You have your red, green, and blue channels, um, which comprise the, the top one there. And if you um, hold down option or command, I'm sorry, and click the RGB, it creates these marching ants all over the screen. And those marching ants are just a selection. And by command clicking that channel, creating a, what's called a luminosity mask. And it's taking inside the image, it's taking any pixels that are over 50% uh, gray and creating those as a selection. And anything that's below 50% gray, it drops it. So I know this, this can be a little bit confusing for people who haven't gone into channels before. So if there's any questions or if I need to slow down, let me know. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and un or deselect that. Because what I want to do is take this first layer off. And I want to go from this layer here and have it sample that to make my luminosity mask. So now I'll command click that again. And now with that selected, I'll go back up to the top layer, highlight that, and then add, just click the mask icon to add a mask. And as you can see, it's already done most of the work. So if I turn this mask off, 
when I disable the mask, you can see the before, and I'll enable the mask, and this is after. So it's brought in all the light into the flower pot here and all into the foreground. And you can also option click the mask to see what it looks like. And you can see that it just it kind of just looks like a black and white image. That's because it's that precise of a mask. And that's kind of what's cool about these things is that they're very detailed. So I'll option click that again to uh, turn that mask off. Hey, James. Yes. Uh, Pete Hill over in the comments is asking what the exposure difference between those two photos was. Like, do you know how many stops it was? Uh, two stops. Okay. Yeah, this was the um, darkest exposure and the and the mid range exposure. I took five. Okay, cool. And then I adjusted them in Lightroom a little bit, so um, and shot in RAW, of course, so I could do that inside of Lightroom. So another thing you can do with these things, there's there's so much you can do. I mean, it's already done a lot of the work for blending these two exposures together, but you can also go back down. Um, to these layers and you know before I go any further I forgot that I was going to show this action that I have that I created um, and you can find these things all over the web but I just did it for the stuff that I'll usually uh, use and if you go over to actions and I'll post a link to this so you can actually download this action if you want I created an action in Photoshop called luminosity channels and it's um, what it does is it goes in and creates a whole laundry list of luminosity masks that you can use. So if I hit function uh, F15, it's going to go through the image and create all the luminosity masks you could ever want to do with an image. And that's going to make your file very large if you save out like a PSD. But now if I scroll down on my channels, you have like lights one, lights two, lights three, lights four. And you can see that they gradually get um, darker and lighter. And then you have darks one, darks two, darks three, darks four. So if you have like just a little bit of light in the scene that you want to adjust, you can use lights four and you know cue that up and, and use that. So all right, um, I'll post a link to that here in a second. So let's say um, I added this luminosity mask and it looks a little bit flat here. So I need to add some contrast. I can go back to this mask that I used the first time, like lights one, and command click that. So that throws the mask back up there. And then I can go over to my adjustments and do like a curves layer. And it's going to use that same mask for the curves layer. So now I can add some points on this curve here, bring down my blacks. Oop, a little out of hand there bring up my whites here so there's just a quick way that you can make an adjustment based on the luminosity masks and um, I'm not going to fully edit this image just because I'd have to go in and remove all these dust spots on the lens um, but the last thing I want to show is how you can add detail so I'll um, merge all these layers all visible the claw and yeah. then you wanna, let's see. <laughs> keyboard shortcut because it's a really good one. Yeah, it's uh, Shift Option Command E. All There's at one an easier time. way to do it. Um, on your watch. Go to no, no, no. Go, go yeah. to um, if you go to layer the layer menu item. Yeah. On the top. On the top. Oh, the layer menu item. Okay. Yep. No, no, no. All the way in the top. Up here. The top of your window. Oh, top oh, of your layer. <laughs> layer. And then um, <laughs> if you press the option key on a Mac or the alt key on a PC and click merge visible, um, yeah. it will do the, that's the, the menu shortcut. It doesn't change it anywhere. It, the, like the, the wording doesn't change or anything, but it's a hell of a lot easier than the claw. Yeah. Um, See, I'm so used to the claw that my four fingers just land on all buttons. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same it's way. It's really quick. In, by, by the way, well, I'm going right? to repeat that one more time. The command, what, what it does is if you're clicking whatever layer you're clicking on, when, if you click command option shift E or uh, control alt shift E for a PC, then it'll take every single visible layer below, merge it, put it on a layer above without actually flattening the entire layer. So yeah. it's a really awesome. good keyboard shortcut. So you could remap that with the... Uh 
with the keyboard shortcuts too, right? To like an F key or something. Oh yeah, you could yeah. totally you yeah. could go into the keyboard shortcuts and and you know have have at it and make your own. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm just just like what I said before, it's so quick now. I just bam and it's done. So um, all but right, the last thing want, I wanted if you to don't show. want it to deform your fingers, then <laughs> you can do a shortcut. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so Brian already gave some love to on one, so I'll I'll use Topaz real quick just to add some um, some detail to this. But you could just as easily use Perfect Effects, and I'm actually going to grab Topaz just because you can kind of easily take it over the top with this software. So I'll just do Crisp. Um, so that's going to add a lot of detail to this photo and make it look terrible. So we'll hit OK. Yes, make it terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and I would normally, you know, bring that back a little bit in Photoshop, but uh, I want to make sure that you can see the difference here. So, um, so this is <clears throat> after Topaz. So what I want to do now is uh, go down to my original layer because I want to you know, mess around with the foreground here mainly. So I'm going to option click that layer to turn that one only on. And if you, again, if you option click the little eye icon there on any layer, it will turn off all the other layers except for that one. And again with my RGB selected on my channels, I'll command click that to bring up the luminosity mask. Then I'm going to go up to my top layer and turn that back on. I don't need these other two anymore since I merged all the visible uh, layers. And now with that selected, I'll hit the mask icon again. All right, so this is my mask. So anything that is black in this mask is going to um, hide the topaz layer uh, um, effect. And anything that is white is going to reveal it. So what I want to do now is go up to uh, filter and stylize and find edges. And this is going to go into the scene and do just that. It's going to find all the edges and almost make it look like a like a pencil drawing. <laughs> and it's gone in and just traced around what it you know what it finds the edges or what it thinks is are the edges inside of the image. So the next step is going to be command L to bring up my levels. And what I want to do here is drag over the blacks and drag over the whites. And that's going to make the image have pure white and pure black inside of it. That way that the sky is completely white. So in this case, it's going to reveal that, um, that topaz effect. And I'll hit OK. All right. And if you're keen on Photoshop, you'll you probably caught on that revealing the sky is the exact opposite of what I want to do with the topaz layer. So now I'll hit uh, Command I to invert that mask. And Photoshop really slows down during Hangouts, I've noticed, at yeah. least for me. So yeah. it's usually not like this at all. But So now with the mask inverted, you can see that the edges are white. So the edges or the white part of the image is going to reveal topaz. And that's exactly what I want. And you can leave it just like this, but um, the last thing I usually do is go over to Blur and Gaussian Blur and just do something like three pixels, something really low like that. And that's just going to expand it, the edges out just a little bit, just so they're not so hard in the image. All right, and then I'll option click that mask again to reveal it. All right, and you might, I don't know on the screen if you can tell, it's a very subtle change. I mean, because it just went into the edges. So I'll, I'll zoom in here pretty close. I'll disable this mask. Oh, I don't want to disable the mask, sorry. Did you know you can shift click to enable and disable your mask? No. <laughs> <laughs> Learn something every day. Yep. <laughs> All right, I'm going to do the claw again. Bam. <laughs> Man, this is going really slow. Hang out. All right, so turn that off. All right, so can you see that kind of 
zoom over the frame there where it goes away and comes back and I'll turn it on. So it's very subtle because it's going into just the edges and it, um, and it leaves it out of the sky so it doesn't even introduce noise. And um, if you wanted to do noise reduction on the image, like in just the sky and the water and, and areas like that, you would do the exact same process, adding the luminosity mask, find edges, and then the sky would be white on your mask instead of black. And it would go into the um, image and remove the noise from all of the white areas. And then it would leave out the edges, which is where you want to add detail and where you don't want to uh, add noise removal because it, it comes at a cost of... Uh, of detail on the image. So that's my tip. Cool. Thanks, James. Yep. And uh, someone who is watching this right now just asked if this is being recorded. And yes, it's being recorded. And it'll post uh, to YouTube. I believe I'll get it up maybe later tonight or tomorrow. So, And I'll post it on my uh, Google Plus timeline when that's up. And we still have a little bit of time. if. Uh, was there, Brian, did you want to talk about on one software at all? <laughs> in, in, in general, or uh, I know somebody asked a question about downloading a trial uh, version, and I think you were going to share something about resize. So if you want to do that, you're welcome to. Uh, I can do the resize thing really quickly. And I actually, I did have another image that I was going to show, uh, which actually uses uh, some Nick software. And I, I just refreshed, and I saw that Mahir asked if uh, any of us use Nick software. And um, I, I think. Most of us do. Yeah. I, I definitely use them, um, even though I work for On1. Um, I certainly do use them. And uh, I, I just really quickly, if, it, if you want, I, I'll be glad to do it. Yeah, go for it. Um, give me one second. I want to make sure that I, I don't think I uh, exported the right image. I find that Nick compliments On1 quite nicely, actually. <laughs> that's a, that's that you're right. You're exactly right. Um, you know, we get that a lot. It's pretty funny at the trade shows. People almost feel like they have to be in one camp or the other. Like, oh, you know, I, I, but I like Nick. I'm like, I love him too, you know. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's, to your point, we do have a, just a tiny bit of overlap with, like, color effects and perfect effects. But um, there's plenty of, of differentiation between the two. Um, so uh, well, let me go ahead and share my screen really quickly. And I'll, sh I'll go. I saw that. I remember the sharpening one. Um, the sharpening question that was asked towards the beginning. So you guys see my screen, right? Yes. Awesome. So uh, this was an image I actually worked on last night. I was actually on a hangout with um, Nicole and Dave, and I was very reticent because I was just in a, in, a, in a funk of some sort, and I was just working on an image. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to show you, um, uh, again, shooting with intent. Like I sh I, This was in Brooklyn um, right before New Year's. Um, actually, Nicole and I were, were in Brooklyn and we were visiting my sister and I wanted to get, I shot this with the intent of doing kind of a very high, high graphic shot, highly graphic, totally LDR. It's the complete opposite of the HDR shot. So LDR is a low dynamic range, which means you have like no mid-tone information uh, and you really embrace uh, clip or clip uh, highlights or clip shadows and blown out highlights. So, I'm going to use silver effects to uh, work on this image, and so I'm just going to go to uh, the uh, Silver Effects Pro 2. Um, that's one of the benefits of, of you know being in the industry is that I get this for free, which is <laughs> awesome. And so, what I want to do is I'm going to start off. I typically start off with the same preset over and over because I really like it, and it's this. It's called Full Dynamic Smooth. Um, and so I'm going to click it, and you can see what it does. It kind of gives us our entire uh, thing here, I'm going to hide the effects bar, or the preset bar on the left there so we can get it. And now it's it's really pretty quick what I want to do here. Um, the first thing I do is I create a, um, a control point, which is kind of what Nick is known for, these kind of U points. I click it and I find out what the size is. And for here, I'm going to jack up the brightness and jack up amplify whites. Uh, and if you put your cursor over the little target bubble here and press the option key, uh, or the Alt key, Option on Mac, Alt on, on Windows, it creates a copy. And so what I do is I kind of start positioning these throughout the image. Um, and it, the, the target bubble actually samples the area that you put it on. And, you know, in some cases you might want to adjust the size of, your, uh, of the, the radius, or rather the, the diameter of your adjustment brush. But um, all I'm doing is I'm kind of putting it in the areas that are dark 
specifically in the background. Um, and now with that done, uh, what I'll do is I'm going to take another control point, a new one. I'll click over here and I'm going to drop the brightness and amplify blacks. And so you can kind of see what I'm getting at right here. Is like I'm going for this highly graphic look. Um, and I'm trying to minimize the spill onto the background here because I don't want to darken it. In fact, here I'm going to take some more of these spots. I'm going to start brightening them up a bit more uh, down here. But while I'm doing that, uh, I'm going ahead and I'm darkening the areas that I want to silhouette totally. And so here, let's drop that brightness. Oops. Uh, amplify blacks. Um, and then bring it up here a bit and down there. Um, and then one over here and drop that. Now you see how it's really, I'll give, I give Nick a lot of credit because it samples beautifully how it's only really affecting the uh, pole up here and not the sky that much. Um, kind of get it here. Now we can further complement the overall scene by using the universal sliders. Uh, I might bring up the uh, contrast and the structure. The structure will give you kind of that um, more grit, more bite to the, uh, the texture. I'm kind of putting it over here and dropping this down. So uh, actually that one can go away. I keep copying it, but my finger is stuck on the option key for some reason. Um, so actually I have one more right there because I want that to be really dark. So what well, we, we consider this to be um, a very highly graphic scene uh, more than, than anything else because you've removed all mid-tone information and you're really relying on shape. Um, you can also simulate a color filter uh, to change the exposure of the scene. And then what I did on my final image, which I think I'll go live tomorrow, is I believe I applied a yeah, coffee um, tone to the image uh, just to give it a bit of a vintage look. Um, also, I went afterwards in, in Lightroom and I rotated it because I wanted to keystone for this, uh, the, this telephone pole. It's slightly crooked over here. Um, but if you look at the original image, if we just hit OK um, and uh, let it process, if I turn off here, this was the image as exposed, and I intentionally expo underexposed. I, I, you know, when I'm out shooting, I'm always thinking about how I'm going to process. I, the, the processing is as important to me as the photography itself. Um, because that's how I my, I've defined my own style is through the processing. Obviously, through the the image. If this image is is a turd, there's no point in doing anything to it. But I find I found the image to be really really compelling with all these leading lines and it's very chaotic. Um, and then I accentuated it by blowing out the sky um, and really really clipping the shadows. And I could have done some more if I spent more time. I could have, but I did like having a little bit of a mat in the sky with those clouds. So. That's just something that I wanted to show you really quickly with silver effects um, using the amplifies and the uh, brightness with the uh, control points. And oh, and so really quickly, uh, I can segue this actually so we can do kind of like can't we all get along and I'll send it to an on one product. Uh, the question was about sharpening. Now, um, there, are two kind of, there are two schools of, of thought with me with sharpening. There's sharpening for output uh, for screen and sharpening for output for print. And for screen, which is basically the web, I just use in Lightroom, um, if you go to Lightroom and you go to the um, export window, which I'll just drag over here really quickly, um, there's an output sharpening option here, uh, which I have. So it outputs, um, I have an output to screen and then standard amount. So um, when my images go out, um, they, uh, they will get used, well, they will use Lightroom's uh, uh, sharpening. For print, that's a totally different story. For print, um, I use a, a different method here. Um, where is it? There it is. Um, <clears throat> I'll use perfect resize. Uh, perfect resize it used to be called Genuine Fractals. And it really is, it's one of those products that, uh, it's one of our legacy products. It's, it's known in the industry because of how well it enlarges. I love perfect resize. Indeed. I just used it the other day for my backlit box order. Awesome. I used it. I used it yesterday for like four large prints. Okay, shut up. You guys have copies already. You don't need to. <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. And thing, I really appreciate it. Um, 
but the, to answer the question, uh, Perfect Resize does have sharpening. Um, you just need to turn it on, and then there are three sharpening methods. Um, unsharp mask is just like you'd find in Photoshop. It's the same unsharp mask. Um, and then high pass and progressive, um, based on what you're looking to sharpen, uh, you'll use one or the other. High pass will sharpen larger details in your scene. Um, and it's a good enough me uh, method, but for me, progressive is my favorite. And progressive will attack smaller details. Um, so the reason why I use progressive so much is because so many of my images are, um, are texture rich. You saw in my previous example where I applied a tonal contrast effect that increases texture, and then the progressive uh, method down here will um, sharpen, though it will target those smaller details. Um, and then one thing to note about perfect resize, it will take, it can take a while. Um, it's definitely slowing because of the hangout, but sharpening is something that can be pretty processor intensive. Uh, so what you'll want to do is the amount here, this amount slider, controls the amount of sharpening. Uh, you, you don't really ever want to go past 25% even with progressive. You could probably stand to drop it down. The other tip that I would tell you, and this is true for any sharpening, when you're sharpening, make sure you're on a one-to-one. -one. You're zoomed into 100%. You see it up here. Um, because that you're seeing actual pixel density. You're seeing the one-to-one the -one pixels. Um, as opposed to fit, when I click that, that was, I think, a 58% or 54% uh, view. So click one-to-one, -one, do your sharpening. And then the uh, highlight and uh, shadows, these are recoveries. So if you want to prevent sharpening from the highlights, you would increase that. And then also, uh, if you want to prevent sharpening from the shadows, you would increase that. So those are what those two sliders are. And in my opinion, this is the best sharpening on the market, um, not just because I work for the company, but um, the prog that progressive sharpening is just something magical. Um, so that's, that was my little thing there. And uh, let me go ahead and turn off screen sharing. Cool. Thanks, Brian. You're welcome. <laughs> So uh, there's one quick question I'm going to tackle because it's a pretty easy one uh, in the comments. And Brianna Townsend, she asked, uh, she asked if someone could explain the difference between like the different file formats, JPEG, TIFF, etc., and um, you know how we use them. Is, is it important to save an image as a TIFF file when editing in a different program? And the quick answer to that is a TIFF and a PSD. Those are both lossless format, formats, which means that you can edit and save and edit and save and open and reopen several times without degrading the actual pixels and without you know, compressing the image. And you can also save layers with both of those file formats. So those are good options. I use the PSD format a lot. Like I don't usually use TIFF. I, I use uh, PSDs in all of my images. JPEG, however, is, is considered a lossy format, which means if you uh, create a JPEG, and then you close it, and then you open it, edit it, save it, and close it, every single time you're doing that, you're recompressing the image over and over. So eventually, you're going to see artifacting and over-pixelation in areas. So it's best, my at least, my standard uh, MO is to just have a JPEG be my final output. If I create an image for print, I'm going to export it as a JPEG, and that's the only time I'm ever going to touch that JPEG is just to open it and print it or to just view it on the web page or whatever I'm going to do with it. I don't re-edit my JPEGs after I've created them. So quick and simple, but we have got to call it an evening for tonight's Hangout. So let's just go through real quickly and say where uh, we can find, everyone can find everyone here in the Hangout. We'll start with Brian and move all the way over to me. What was the question? <laughs> where can we find you, man? <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just responding to a thing, um, <laughs> and uh, you can uh, you can just find me at, at plusbrian.com. Uh, that takes me to my to your to my Google Plus profile, um, and just really quickly um, before we move on, uh, actually we can do it at the end. I have a, I did a, a random drawing where I'll give away a copy of the suite, and I have my winner. Oh yeah. Okay. Dave, you can find, me, find, you? find me at plusdave.com. That's P L U S D A V E.com. James. You can find me at james brandon.com or on Google, Plus, but not by plusjames.com. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm on Google, Plus. you can find me at nicoleseplus.com. It's N I C O L E S Y. And I also have a blog at nicoleseblog.com. 
And Brian, you said that you picked the winner. What for? What did you give him? Well, I didn't pick the winner. I picked the winner. I didn't announce yet. They're going to get a free copy of the suite. Um, okay. What I did was I, um, I took the, everyone who wasn't you or me or Dave or James, um, in comments, and, and so that was the order, like one, two, three, four. But, and then I just did a random number generator. And uh, uh, how nice that actually the person who was just expl saying that <laughs> he wants to buy it, but Chris Bagley uh, won uh, the random drawing. So Chris, um, yay. Yeah. Was that a three hundred dollar value? That is a three hundred dollar value for the nice. suite six. So just email me. I'll put my email address again here, um, and I'll get you a license so that you uh, you can enjoy it. So you don't even need the trial, or you can download the trial and, and enter in your license code. But uh, um, I'm glad to do it. I want to fill up. I see here. Um, Pete asked a question. I, I'll, I'll. I want to talk about gear. You know, I, I I've got leftovers that I can reheat. So I'm not in any rush. <laughs> well, we gotta end the hangout because I have to edit and broad and uh, re this thing is recorded, and I only have so much time to work with. So. How much time do you have? I think it's an hour and a half. Is that right, Dave? It's either an hour and a half or two hours. Nobody is sure. <laughs> oh, so you once, once you go, once you go beyond that point, you cannot edit it in YouTube. Yeah, you can so go beyond it and it will record, but you have to download it and edit it and then re-upload it. Well, we're gonna go ahead and call it for the night then. Um, thanks everyone for watching and uh, if you want to watch the recorded version and, and catch some of the things that maybe we went really quickly on or you just want to make sure you really have it solidified then uh, it should be posted on my Google Plus profile pretty soon and it will of course be on my YouTube channel. Thanks for watching everyone. Bye. bye. Oh bye. <laughs>